Fine, fine, fine. We will talk about the Enterprise J, the frying pan in space. No, seriously, because how can you even make a starship that flat? Apparently you can. I don't know about you, but to me, it looks like the Sovereign class just got trapped in a waffle iron and squished. It makes no sense. And look, we've spoken about a lot of Enterprises here on Trek Central. Anyone would think that we're a Star Trek channel or something. I mean, where would that idea come from? In our recent video, we even spoke about the fate of every known USS Enterprise, or rather just Enterprise period, in Star Trek. And admittedly, yes, we did miss the Enterprise J. But, and stick with me here, there is a good reason for that. It's up for debate. Did the Enterprise J even actually exist in the end. And again, stick with me, as in this Star Trek Explained video, we're not only talking about the technical details of this thing, but we're also asking the really important Star Trek questions. Thanks to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. A comfortable chair is essential when commanding a starship, yet it's also essential when working from home. Flexibot kindly sent out their brand new C7 Air Premium Ergonomic Office Chair. As someone who spends most of their day sitting at a desk and writing these YouTube videos, I'm always concerned about good posture. Believe it or not, good posture helps with productivity. The Flexibot June sale is on right now, and you can save up to 60% off. The C7 Air allows for multiple seating positions. So if you're more of a cross-legged type of worker, or perhaps you're like me and prefer to be forward leaning. The C7 Air is also built for all shapes and sizes, so even our editor can sit and enjoy better posture. So make it so and check out FlexiSpot C7 Air today. You can use the links in our video description to check out the sale and save up to 60% off. Enjoy the video. And once again, a big thank you to FlexiSpot for sponsoring the video. So, without further ado, sing it if you know it. Welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I am, of course, your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam. And before we get into the video proper, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. And you can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. And as always, go ahead and crack those knuckles and type those keys in the comments section below with your thoughts, because if you're talking about Star Trek, we do want to hear about about it, so have at it. Okay, engage. Now, as I said before, unfortunately, we know very little about the actual technical aspects of the Enterprise J. I'm being serious about this. Writing this script, I'm told, was a bit of a nightmare as we struggled to find any information about what it could have on board at all. I personally even floated the idea of making this thing just a short. It was a ship. It had a corridor. The corridor had a window in it. A Prometheus class flew by it once, and that version got shot down. Why? Because the window thing was, checks notes, extraneous or repetitive information. Yes, repetitive. But if we had to theorize, given that we've only seen the Enterprise J in one episode, and even then for less than 15 seconds or thereabouts, it does likely have your typical Starfleet loadout of phasers, torpedoes, shields. Given its placement in the 26th century, it's likely that it would possess some superior firepower to 24th century Starfleet, and of course, defenses to match. But in terms of scale, the Star Trek design design team on Enterprise envisioned the ship being around two miles long. Still nowhere near the length of the small Rouge one, but still the largest Enterprise to date at the very least, so it's got that going for it. There are no details on how its propulsion works, although designers did theorize that by the 26th century, even transwarp speeds would be obsolete when it came to faster than light travel. Due to the lack of information on this subject, though, we leave this discussion largely open to you lot. What do you think the Enterprise J would have regarding weapons, defense, more systems. And how about this? Doug Drexler. Yes, you, you fantastic person. If by some miracle you are watching this, then we do formally invite you to film a video with us where we dig into the insights of the Enterprise J with the madman behind it. And I say that with the utmost respect. We of course mean that respectfully because if you want to build a two mile long Enterprise, then you've got to be crazy, right? Right? No, but we're serious, Doug. We would love to have you on board, even just for this one video. Okay, I'll move on now. 
Officially, we only know of one battle in which the Enterprise J participated. This would, of course, be in the possible future, including the Battle of Procyon, Procyon, Pro-Onion. Yes, it's an old joke, but I'm repeating it anyway. Five. The battle that saw the Federation forces successfully drive back the Sphere Builders to their trans-dimensional realm, and it served as the final confrontation between the Federation and the Sphere Builders. However, the Builders witnessed the outcome of this battle as they had access to technology that enabled them to survey alternative timelines, and no Knowing they would lose to the Federation, they contacted the Zindi in the past. They then tricked the Zindi into believing that humanity was responsible for wiping them out in the future, and the goal here was to prevent the Federation from being founded at all. Thus, the future with the Enterprise J would never have happened. Enter Temporal Agent Daniels, someone we have a video coming up on very soon. Although, unfortunately, it isn't an epic rap battle between him and Daniel Jackson from SG-1. That would be amazing. Daniels transported Captain Jonathan Archer through time to witness the Battle of Onion 5, and the captain of the NX-01 Enterprise was on board the USS Enterprise. Enterprise J to witness the Federation defeating the Sphere Builders. Archer watched on as a Dauntless class, a Nova class, and a Prometheus class starship engaged Sphere Builder vessels. A Klingon Vorcha class attack cruiser was also present in the engagement. Daniels hoped that Archer would abandon his planned suicide mission and instead make peace with the Zindi in his own time. Uh, namely his own time period, not just like, whenever you're ready mate, there's no rush. Totally fine. Where was Daniels from? In reality, this timeline with the Enterprise J may have actually been negated. Hence the question at the beginning of the video, whether it even existed at all. Because remember, the NX-01 Enterprise destroyed the network of the Delphic Expanse spheres in 2151. And as such, with the timeline not being the future of the Federation anymore, that calls into question whether or not the Enterprise J would ever even have been built. So yes, we sadly don't know much information about the Starship to dig into on this situation. And therefore, we have to go ahead and look at the extended canon of Star Trek to get a little bit more about the USS Enterprise J. And I don't know about you lot, but I actually really like it when we get to do this, because it gives you all kinds of different possibilities. And to be clear, yes, it's a little disclaimer, once again, extended canon is stories from books, comics, video games, and more, not stuff that was seen on screen. Calm down. We've been over this before. Four. Anyway, the Enterprise J does make an appearance twice in Star Trek Online. In the mission Ragnarok, the player encounters the Enterprise during the famous Battle of Onion 5. Upon boarding the ship, the player encounters Pavel Chekhov and Montgomery Scott, who help the player install the Tox Utat. This device would be used by the Enterprise J to destroy the Sphere Builder's command sphere and thwart the plans of the Temporal Liberation Front. There's also the mission The Battle of Procyon 5, which has players defending the Enterprise J while the ship moves towards the Sphere Builder's command sphere. However, the the Temporal Liberation Front is already manipulating the timeline and forcing the battle to repeat itself. Eventually, the ship is booming, but the Sphere Builders are defeated. Following the conclusion of the mission and the closing of all temporal portals, all temporarily displaced people like Chekhov and Scotty are returned to their respective home eras, undoubtedly with some stories they're never allowed to tell. We presume the Enterprise J served for some time following these events, especially as it took place in the 2550s, of course. And it was even revealed that the ship was under the command of Captain Dax. Yes, a host of that Dax symbiont. Although sadly, we don't know the eventual fate of the Enterprise J. And by the time of Star Trek Discovery's third, fourth, and fifth seasons, which will take place in the 32nd century, there is no sign of an active USS Enterprise starship. Whether the J was the last ship in the Enterprise legacy to date is currently unknown. If there actually was one, we still don't know. But currently it is the most in the future Enterprise that we know of. But what other adventures do you think it got up to? Comments, 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 folks. So now we dive into the barely understood background of the thing. The design of the Enterprise J was complex, contrary to the appearance of it being rapidly ran through a hydraulic press. Legendary Star Trek designer Doug Drexler was tasked with the job. He wanted the future Enterprise to look as futuristic as possible, even though it was only going to be on screen for a matter of seconds. The original plan for the J was to have it on screen and be taking part in the Battle of Procyon 5. Therefore, 
the art department set about designing it. Herman Zimmerman, the production designer, gave the task to Drexler. The initial brief was for three Starship designs, which would be at least 400 years ahead of where we were at the point. Drexler's biggest challenge was developing a design that looked more advanced than Trekkies had seen ever before. Drexler set out to retain elements of Starfleet's traditional design essence, i.e. two hulls and two warp nacelles. However, he wanted to push these shapes as far as he could, evidently, literally. He went with the spindly nacelle struts because it suggested a technology beyond what people were familiar with, and Matt Jeffries used this same approach on the original series ships with its impossible thing engine supports. The Enterprise J's nacelles had a floaty appearance, essentially defying the laws of physics, something which Discovery would tell it to hold its beer about while it introduced nano-programmable matter and actual factual floaty nacelles. Yes. While the J would have a deflector dish, Drexler imagined that by the 26th century, the transwarp technology would be somewhat obsolete. So instead, ships like this could simply fold space, and the Federation was already exploring other galaxies besides the Milky Way. Drexler also intended for the J to be the biggest enterprise ever, like we've mentioned before, making the ship two miles long. And while the saucer section of the J looked thin in design, it was actually intended to be 30 decks thick. There was an idea generated here that turbo lifts would be replaced with site-to-site -site transporters due to the ship's scale. Now, we see this in Star Trek Discovery's 32nd century. While ships like Discovery still do have some turbo lifts operational, there's much more of a precedent for using site-to-site -site or personal transporters for reporting to the bridge and such. Regarding the ship's production, the team had the idea that the Enterprise J would not be welded together like 23rd century starships, for example, but instead it would be grown like a plant. Building on this idea, Drexler produced new pencil sketches showing a ship with a massive oval saucer and very thin nacelles on spindly struts. This led to the creation of the basic 3D model showing the design, and there was also an alternative design that he developed with Mike Okuda. This was a V-shaped primary hull instead of a saucer. Ultimately, Drexler's design would be approved and dubbed the Universe Class. But what do you think of the Enterprise J? Admittedly, yes, this video is very light on the details, but I hope you can forgive us, as we simply don't know very much about that ship in canon. I mean, we could just make it up, but despite being absolutely hilarious, it wouldn't really be very truthful, though, would it? But anyway, please leave your comments down below, and if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, laws, and more, then by all means, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media, or join the community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam, Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends. You know, maybe it was just made out of cake. That might explain the flat thing.